But why don't you do this? Turn to Psalms chapter 139. I love Psalms 139. And, and, and you do too. For those of you who have read your Bibles before, you've been in Christendom long enough, you know when I start reading Psalms 139, you will understand where we're going. But before we go there, I, I want to talk a little bit about something. And the first thing is this idea of the empty chair. There's an empty chair there, and that's all I'm going to say about that. Okay? You just pay attention. Listen to the words. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, the first thing that I, I want to, as we look at the empty chair, I want to talk about an idea. And I, I don't use uh, theological terms all the time, but I think it's a good time to talk about theophany. Just say theophany. theophany. That's pretty good. One more time. Theophany. Theophany. Okay, Theo is God. Ophany is, is sighting. So this, it's appearance of God in the form of a man. Okay, now who remembers Ezekiel 47 yes, last week? Right, we talked about the bronze man. It's a theophany. The burning bush was a theophany. Okay, not just God appearing as a man, but God appearing as something. Okay, everybody kind of understand that? At this point, so, so in, if we know the story of Elijah, you remember when Elijah goes up on the mountain and because he's running away from Jezebel and he's up there and he's a, there's an earthquake and there's all this stuff going on. And then it says the wind, there was a still, there was like a, a, a quiet breeze and it says God was in the breeze. So that was a theophany. Does that, does that make sense? You guys follow me so far? But Jacob, there's a moment when he's wrestling. He's wrestling with God. That's a really cool story. It's a theophany. So throughout the Old Testament, we see this. In fact, one of the best stories is the fiery furnace. The three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? And they're in the fire. And then what happens? The theophany, right? Uh, the fourth one shows up. It's a theophany. And throughout the Old Testament, we see these theophanies happening, these, these moments where God appears. Pretty cool, right? From Genesis all the way through Malachi, right? We see God appearing over and over and over again in, in different forms, both in nature and as a man, as something. There, that God is appearing. And, and some of the coolest moments that we see in the Bible are there. But what's interesting is in the Old Testament, what we see is that God is defined by the locale he's at, by his location. Here's what I mean by that. Think about the Israelites, and they're on a journey, and they get to the mountain of God. You guys ever heard that before, the mountain of God, right? God was defined to the mountain, okay? They could see up. They looked up, and what they see? They saw fire and smoke and rumblings and they heard stuff and they're like that's the mountain of God he was defined by his locale his location do you remember the ark the, the temple right the tabernacle he was defined by his location the ark of the covenant he was located if I wanted to find God if I wanted to know God I would go to the holy of holies right I'd go to the ark you know, before they created the temple, I would go to the mountain, right? They, they knew where God was. And it was interesting, like Jacob would wrestle with God, and, and it talks about him creating an altar, and that became a locale. In fact, Jehovah Jireh, one of the coolest moments, right, in, in, in these stories, if we, we understand Abram, he's taking his son to sacrifice his son, and he, he ends up creating an altar there. And then for generations after that, they all knew, oh, that's where Jehovah Jireh showed up, Amen. my provider. Amen? You guys follow along? So in the Old Testament, it's full of these theophanies that happen. But it's also full of these places where they say, okay, this is where God is at. They define him to a locale, a location. Okay? If you talk to a, a, a good Hebrew today, they would talk about being God, uh, God being in a location. I go to the synagogue to go meet with God. I go to the wailing wall to go meet with God. There's locations. Everybody following along? Because it's important to understand that these, the, these theophanies, they were interesting because they did a couple things. They, they made God clear 
to people. It made God's directions very, very clear. We see God showing up. Remember the Abram story? We talked about him and God says, hey, I want you to leave everybody you know. Okay, I know this theophany that happened. And he said, I want you to leave everyone you know. Go into a land that you don't know. I'm going to bless you so you can be a blessing. Okay, he made, he made the directions for Abram very, very clear. God laid out the directions for him. God says, I'm going to protect you. Protect you. His protection was given. Right? We, we can get, go to like a, 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 a Joshua, right? He's getting ready. Moses has died. He's getting ready. And God says, don't, don't you be courageous. I got you. I'm the angel that's going to fight with you, right? I'm, you're, you know, and so the God's protection was given. And, but it was also mar- it was a mark for a turning point in the person's life. Amen? Again, think about the Old Testament. When God showed up, what happened? People changed. A lot of times their name changed. Jacob became an Israel. Abram became an Abraham. Sarai became Sarah, right? Their names changed, their direction. There was a turning point in their lives in the Old Testament, right? As we, as we see them and, and they would set up these altars, they set up these moments and they would say, that's where God visited me and that's where my life was changed. That was where my life was, was you know, turned around and, and I, I'll never be the same because God met me there. And they would go on pil- pilgrimages, right? They, they'd go in these journeys and, and go back to those moments and they'd tell their kids and their grandkids and their great grandkids, hey, this is where God met me. Amen. This is where it all happened. That's good. But God was defined by his location. Remember that. As we, try, we, we turn to Psalms chapter 139, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna try to read, I wanna read the whole thing because it's just one, such a beautiful Psalm, but it start, starts out, it says, Oh Lord, you have searched me and know me. Now this is David writing. He says, you know, when I sit down and when I rise up, God knows you. David's like, God, you, you search me, you know me. You know, when I sit down, you won't know when I rise up. You know, when I go to bed, you know, when I, when I get up, you know, every moment you search out my path and you know everything about me. And then down to verse seven, it says, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? He says, God, if I ascend to the heavens, you're there. God, if I make my bed in Sheol, death. If I make it in the lowest parts in death, you're still there in the grave. God, you are there. He says, if I take up the wings of the morning and and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, there your hand shall be with me. Even there your hand shall lead me. He says, God, where, where can I go? And I, I, I motion this, I talk about this because that is totally different from what we saw in the Old Testament. Because they define God by his locale. This is where God showed up to me. And therefore, when I go back to that point, God will be there. He was in the mountain, so every time I go to the mountain, he's there. He was in the ark, and every time I go to the ark, he's there. But right here, right where I'm standing, he's not been, so therefore he's not here. That is, a, that is a Hebrew understanding. that They didn't see God in the way that sometimes you and I hopefully can see God. But David was so much different. David, a man after God's own heart, a worshiping warrior, said, you know what, God, no matter where I go, you, you're there. He said, all these other guys, they, they, they've put these locations on you. and They've put these moments and said, well, this is where God can be. And, but he's not, he's not been here yet. I'm not saying he can't come here, but he's not been here yet. You guys follow along? Hey, and, and, but David looks at it and says, but God, where can I go? Where can I go that your spirit's not already there? Where can I go that you can't see me? Where can I go that you, you, you don't know me? Where can I go that you don't know my path already? Where can I go that you don't see what I'm doing right now? And, and he says, God, there's no place. The highest place I can go, the heavens, you're there. The lowest place I can go the, in my grave, God, you were there. He says, in the seas, God, you are there. No matter where I go, you are there. David was the first one to talk about God being everywhere. 
Now, we have a term for that, and we call it omnipresent. He's over, always present. He's everywhere. Amen? There is no place. Now, David, he's like, he's like God, all these other people, the patriarchs, they, they all put you in a location. But God, I believe you're everywhere. But David had this other understanding of God not only being everywhere, but in every time. Psalm chapter 139, verse 16, he says, you, Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. David says, God, not only are you everywhere, but you're in every time. Meaning, God, you're in the future and in the past and in the present all at the same time. Isn't that, how do you fathom that? How do you grab a hold of that? God, God that you know my today, and, and yet at the same time, you still know my yesterday and my tomorrow. You are in every time. Not only are you everywhere, but you're in every time. God, I don't even know what's going to happen the next minute, and yet you know every day I have. Every day allotted for me. He says that you even formed me in my mother's womb. That, that even before, listen to this, your eyes saw my unformed substance. Grab that for a second. Your unformed, before you were matter, before you had an atom, before you had any nucleus, before you had anything at all, God saw you and knew you. Hallelujah. Right, that should get you a shout right there. That he knew everything about you before you were even formed. Before your mommy ever met your daddy. Before your grandparents even met. Before Adam and Eve. Before the foundation of the world. That he saw and knew you. Anybody else have goosebumps? I got a little Holy Spirit in me right now, just, just trying to grab that God is everywhere and in every time. Where can I go, God, that you're not there? Where can I hide from you that you don't, you don't see me, you don't know me, you, don't, you know everything? Of where? And David's only response is, I give up. God, you're everywhere. There's nothing I can do. You know who you never play hide and seek with, Nez, Right? God, he already knows. He knows where you're going to hide even before you hide. Even before you start the game, he already knows. When we start the game, he's going to be there. Don't mess with God. He's figured it out. Adam and Eve, it's such an interesting story because they hide from God. Duh. They hear him and they're like, oh, we better hide. And David is probably, I wonder if David was thinking about them. Those guys, they're so funny. What were they thinking? They're hiding from God. Like he doesn't already know. He knew before he created them what they were going to do. Exactly where they're going to hide. He knew he was going to have to make clothes for them. He knew. He knows everything about you. You realize that? Everything about you. He knows, his, he knows every single day, and he knows your location. He knows your location a year from now or two years from now or 50 years from now if he tarries. He knows everything about you. David believed that with his whole heart. He believed that. And he's, like, he's like, wow. But in the Old Testament, they didn't have that belief. They always thought God was kind of in a locale. Not that he didn't know what was going on, but he was quite everywhere until he showed up. They wondered when he, they were in Egypt for those hundreds of years as slaves. God, where were you? Is what they would say. And his response, hey, by the way, you know, Joseph, the guy with the, the coat of many colors, I actually prophesied this. That's what God would tell him. I knew. He goes, you're going you're gonna to be in Egypt these, these hundreds of years. This is what's going to go on. 
So, so you, you don't think I was there? He renew. And I wonder how many of us have that same question. For, where were you, God? And here he knew. And he already knows. He's already moving. He's already figuring it out. Because before you were anything, God knew you. But then we fast forward. Let's go all the way to Jesus. And I love this because in, in John chapter 14, Jesus is kind of explaining. He's trying, to, he's trying to end his earthly ministry, right? <laughs> I mean, I, this is not my notes, but I wanted to say this one time. Understand this. Jesus is the coolest theophany ever. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not just a form of man. Jesus came as man. Amen. It wasn't just a moment. It wasn't just for, hey, I'm going to be here, the burning bush for a couple minutes. Amen. He says, I'm going to spend some time with my creation. Wow. They had no clue what was going on. So many of them. God with us. Emmanuel. We all sing the song. That's what it was. But, but Jesus shows up and he's getting ready to end his ministry. And, and I don't know what he was dealing with at that moment. I don't know if he was like, like, man, these guys just don't get it. So often that's what we can read because the, the disciples, just like you and I, are just dense. And they just didn't get it. But he's getting close to the end. And he's telling them like his last words, the last things he's, he's trying to just get them through. In John chapter 14 we see, and he says, I will ask the Father. That's pretty cool. I just, I, when I see that, I'm like, Jesus is talking to his dad, right? Because I'm going to ask the Father for this. And he goes, and I will give you another helper. Big H, by the way. Another helper. To be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. He says, I'm going to ask the Father to send a helper. I'm going to ask the Father to send the Holy Spirit. I'm going to ask God to send his theophany into the world forever from now on. Are you guys following? Forever. He says, it's, it, it, no longer am I going to be just a locale. No longer am I going to just be a moment. And yeah, I'm Jesus and I was with you for 33 years roughly, right? But no longer will you ever have to be alone. That's what he said. He said, I, don't worry, guys. I know I'm leaving, but I'm sending you somebody better. Because he will always be with you. He will never leave you. He's always going to be there. You're not going to have to search for him because he's already there. He says to be with you forever. Jesus' words, not mine. Forever. And then we go back to David and we're like, oh, David figured it out. David already knew. He, he understood that God was a God that was always here in time and in location. That no matter where I go, God's already there. He's been there. He's seen it. He's done it. He's just waiting for me to get there. And he's there while I'm in it. And he's already gone ahead of me to the new location that I'm at. While at the same time, he's still in the same location. That God is here and he's also with me 10 years from now. But he's been with me the whole time. But he's already went ahead of me to prepare the ground. So when I get there, it's ready for me. But he never left me when I was here. Amen. Jesus says, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. That, he's leaving. He says, I'm gonna, I've got to go do some work. But I'm going to send you someone that will never have to leave you. Everyone else saw God as being in a locale. Well, guys, it's time to go to church. Oh, good. We get to see God. Yep. Guys, let's go. We're, we're, we're going go, to go to the mountain of God. Oh, yeah, we get to see God. Guys, it's, sing the, it's time to sing worship. Oh, good. We get to see God. And God's like, but I've been here the whole time. He said, when you woke up, I was already there. When you were brushing your teeth. 
I was there. When you went to work, I was already at work waiting for you to come. But, oh, by the way, I was still with you in the car ride over. Come on, think about it. But I wonder how many of us really believe that. How many of us really act that way? That God is here or God is there. How many of us welcome him into our lives, set a place up for God and say, okay, God, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to move. Some, there's something going on and, and I'm going to grab and take you with me because I'm over here now, God. How many of us act like God is actually with us? Or are we looking around going, okay, God, please come. Won't you come, Lord? God, where are you? Hello? God, can you hear me? But he's been there the whole time. He said, just set a place for me. Just know that wherever you go, I'm already there. And I've stayed with you the whole time. He said, you're, you're walking over here as if I'm not there, but I'm already there. You just forgot to take me with you. Oh, don't want to say that, do we? I, you just forgot me. You got so enrolled and in, in, in wrapped in your own, enthralled in your own, just set in your own ways that you forgot me. You got busy. It's like leaving your kid at a grocery store. Not that I've ever done that before. And realizing you get in the car and like, oops, I think I forgot something. I hear a lot of laughing. That means some of y'all have done it too. God says, I want, you, I want you to carry me with you. So by the way, you're not carrying me. I'm carrying you. Just FYI. Just understand, you know. But he says, just take me with you. And you can oh, you sit here? Okay. Then I, I, I'm there. See, I believe that we need to start changing our mindset and be like David and say, God, where can I go that you're not already there? But the thing we don't ever understand, and I think that doesn't get in the very heart of us, is that God is always looking for an invitation. There's free will. And I have free will to say, God, let's go. Or I have free will to say, okay, God, you stay. And so often we go on our own journey. We've left him back there. And then we're crying out to God, why, God, why aren't you moving? And God's like, well, you never invited me. You didn't set up a chair for me. You didn't set up a place for me. So by the way, I'm, I, I'm, I'm still here. I've still been with you the whole time. But you never invited me. And now you're crying at me and saying, God, where were you? And he said, well, if you would have just invited me. If you would have just included me, if I would have been part of your life. Christianity, this thing we call Christianity, it's about a relationship. And we could say it over and over again. But the relationship should never end. And if you go to work and you don't take him, it's not God's fault. If you go home or you deal with your family members or friends and you, and you wonder where God is, did you even invite him in the situation? You wonder why things aren't going on your, in your life? Have you invited God in and say, okay, God, where can I go that you're not already there? So therefore, I'm going to make sure I invite you in. I'm going to make sure and I'm going to carry you. I'm going to be with you and I'm going to look to you. And it's not me carrying God like, okay, God, I'm going to help you get here. It's me acknowledging, God, you're here already. And I need you to do something. So when I go buy a car, ladies, listen to me. Single ladies, when I go ready to date a man, fellas, single guys, when I go ready to date a girl, did you even ask God? You're making a job decision, making a car decision, making a life decision. Do 
You know, can I just share this with you? This is how my mind works. I believe God is, wants to be involved in everything to the point that there are times when I pull into a parking lot, and don't yell at me for this, but I ask God, God, would you get me a rock star parking spot? Because God, I got so much to do today. God, would you? And I believe he does it. I believe it because I'm his favorite. And so are you. God likes you. But we need to invite him in. We need to invite him and say, God, I'm, I'm about to do something or I'm about to do nothing. God, I'm about to watch this movie. Would you join me? The youth, ask the youth. I've, I, I challenged them on Tuesday night. I said, we're going on a God hunt. And we watched a bunch of movie clips. I said, where's God? Where do you see God in that movie? Where is God? He's everywhere. But are we looking for him? Are we acknowledging him? God, I'm about to do this. Or I'm about to hang out, and I want to hang out with you. God is in everything. And every time. But he only moves with those who turn their eyes on Jesus and look full into his face and say to him, Jesus, I need you now. Not because my life is tough. Not because my situations are, are, are bad. God, it's a great day today. Thanks for being with me. God, I'm having an awesome time. How's your day going, God? I want to end with this. We're going to receive communion. I'm going to end with, this is my opinion, okay? This is not theologically based. But I think the reason that we want to leave God over there is so we can do our own life. I've shared this before. I, you know, one of my favorite comedy movies is Goldfinger. Austin Powers. Don't watch it. It's not R-rated. Right? It's not R-rated. You know, I don't watch R-rated movies. It's my own conviction. But I understood something as I began to watch those movies. It probably should have been, just FYI. But I realized God and I couldn't hang out together when I was watching that movie. So I had to make a decision. It's either God or the movies. Now, Pastor Jen had just, want, just bought me the, the, the three-pack, all three movies, collector's edition. And it was, a, it was a struggle. I love Mike Myers. I, I tell you, he's one of my favorite comedians. Some of his movies are, Wayne's World is my favorite movie of all time. And I remember fighting with God and saying, but God, it's okay. It's, it's not R. You told me not to watch R. I don't watch R, God. And, 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 and it's, it's okay. And I just kept hearing him say, but I can't be with you. Because you're not holy any longer. You're not set apart any longer. You're focusing on things that, that you shouldn't be focusing on. And I remember putting it in the box for goodwill. Now again, this is an expensive three-pack of movies. And I was like, well, at least I'll, I'll, I'll give it to somebody. It won't be a big waste of, movie, uh, of money. And I, I remember driving, and as I'm driving to goodwill... God's like, what are you doing? Throw that trash out. He said, what are you doing? If it's not good enough for you and my relationship, you're going to give it to someone else and ruin them? He 
think about it. If we walked around and said, okay, God, you're with me. You're with me, God. How much of the stuff you're doing right now you wouldn't do if you knew he was sitting right next to you? And he would have to say to you, I know you want me with you, but I can't be with a sinner. Anyone else feel that? God's trying to speak this morning because he's calling you to a deeper relationship with him. And there is garbage that is going on that we do far too often. And we're okay, we're comfortable leaving God because in the, deep inside of us, we, we believe just like the early Hebrews, that God is in a location. Deep down inside, that's how we act. Well, I, I don't act that way with my Christian friends. I don't listen to that with my Christian friends. But if I believe God is everywhere, then the one I worship, the one I love, he's there with me when I'm telling those bad jokes, when I'm laughing at those bad jokes, when I'm watching what I shouldn't be watching, I'm listening to what I'm listening. Kids, when I'm doing the TikTok that I shouldn't be doing, I'm just trying to be as real as I possibly can. Because y'all, you, you got to understand something. This, this is how David could get through what he got through. This is how David defeated Goliath. God, where can I go that you're not already there? So what that guy's big? So what that his sword is bigger than I am? I got God. Even when he's in the cave, y'all, he's in a cave wondering if Saul's going to kill him on the other side. David says, where can I go? I'm in a cave. God's in the cave with me. What should I fear? We wonder, how is it these guys in the Bible did so much? I believe this is it. And deep down inside, they said, God is with me. And if God is for me, who can be against me? And if I invite God in every moment, everything I do, everything I think, every decision, whether it's a, it's a grand decision or it's a minor decision, if I act like God is there, then I'm not going to go wrong. I'm not going to fall away. There's enough of you in this room. We could share testimonies of the times that we walked away from God, walked away from the destiny that God had for us. And it was this, every single time. It was compromised. It was walking away and saying, it's not that bad. It's, it, it doesn't affect me that much. Having this relationship or doing this or that, doesn't, doesn't, it's not that bad. And God's like, but I can't be with you when you're doing that. You've walked away from me. But the great part of that story is that he's always on the other side waiting for us to come back to him. But is it, if the ushers would come forward this morning, I want to receive communion. Because communion to me is one of the best pictures to explain this. Let me explain it this way. Brother Donovan, you want to help out here? Jesus said that, that when he was getting ready to go, he was explaining to him this new covenant, this new communion that he was going to set up. And he said, this is my body, take, eat. This is my blood, drink it. This is grape juice and some very soft white bread. We can look at it and we say, oh, that's cool. 
and we do it in remembrance. But we're talking about a God who is everywhere and in every time. Everywhere and in every time. That means that Jesus right now in that time 2,000 years ago was hanging on the cross. Right now. Do you follow? This is not just a remembrance. This becomes the actual body. We join with that Last Supper. We join with Jesus saying, eat, this is my body. Drink, this is my blood. When we partake of communion, we're joining in a God that's in every time and every place. And the coolest part is we're consuming him. So it means he's in this place forever. Forever. Isn't that what we should long for? Isn't that what we should desire? That we would, we would have his blood flowing through us. That we'd have his body in us, moving us. Giving us the energy to move and to think and to act. That's what communion is. Communing with God. Deeper than we've ever imagined before. How many of us are willing to go deeper than we've ever gone before? How many of us are willing, able, ready to say, God, I want to take you with me. God, this is your blood. This is your, 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 your body that you pour out for me. And, and I'm going to take it. And, and I'm not going to just remember it and then go on. But I am taking it with me. So that I understand what flows in me is, my, is the blood of Jesus Christ. I understand the body that I've taken is no longer my body. It's, it's his body flowing in me and moving me. There's a song and it just, it just says this. It's like, I, I never want to leave. I'm caught up in your presence. And I believe, I'm foolish enough to believe that there is a truth there that I could walk in his presence. You talk to some of my life group guys Tuesday, Tuesday morning at Dunkin' Donuts. We have a lot of presence time. We're not getting up and shouting. We're not crying. We're not babbling. But a lot of times we do have an open chair there. And there's times all of us just kind of look over. Oh God, you're awesome. Look at what you've done. I, I believe if we walk around as Christians this way, we'll be radically changed.